Hello and welcome back to Revender in Sports and another edition of George's Rants. <laughs> so there was a video just recently that I posted about uh, Bike Geometry 101, Stack and Reach. What is it? And there was a, a, a comment from a viewer and his name is Jarhead46. So let me read you the comment. I'll also read you the my response. And it goes on to say, what a retro grouch. No endurance bikes, disc brakes, float on pedals, on and on. Newsflash, not everyone is you. Of course, my response was correct. Everything was better years ago. The latest and greatest really isn't. Endurance bikes are just marketing, just like the chan just like a women's specific bike. Disc brakes, I'm sorry, I need my glasses. Disc brakes on road bikes are overkill and poorly designed. Basically, they are shit and more marketing that has fooled everyone to think that they need and they are better. They're not. Rim for road, disc for dirt. Float, especially 20 degrees, as in the X speed play pedals, is a crutch and enables poor pedal mechanics and on and on. Newsflash, you don't have to watch my channel and not everyone is you. And it got me thinking, God, I am a retro grouch and I'm so proud of it. I love older bikes because they were designed better and they are still around. They are still being ridden. I just did a video on my Serata that's 25 years old. If you were to fast forward 25 years, the carbon bikes that are being made today, I, I, I can't even think what crap they will be 25 years from now. Anyway, in addition to Jarhead46, I hope you're still watching because I want you to actually learn something from my channel. In addition to Jarhead46, I just saw a video a couple of days ago uh, from Cycling Weekly. And they talked about six things they'd like to see return to bikes. So I'm not the only person talking about older things being better on newer bikes. And then there was another video that I watched, Cycling Tips, about um, the Cannondale Synapse. And so I want to combine all these things and kind of talk to you about this. Now, before I go any further, another thing about my channel. I like to take my time to explain concepts to you. If you like quick and dirty answers, this is not a TikTok channel. This is not a TikTok video. These are not 15 second attention span videos. These are videos where I give you the point. I then develop the argument for that point, And then I move on to the next point. This is not rapid fire round. This is not any of that stuff. This is a channel that I want to spend the time to educate you and if you have a valid counterpoint, I wish to have that discourse in the comment section. I will learn something from my viewers. And that's the reason for this community. So we can exchange ideas. It doesn't mean I've got the only answer. And I'm willing to learn from other folks. So that's the purpose of this channel. And if you want quick answers, I'm not the channel for you you don't have the attention span, please move on. There was another video where a, a, a viewer on, uh, in the title, I said, did you know the L03A was being replaced by the L05A? These are Shimano brake pads. It says it in the title, pretty much. But then he says, the commenter says, oh, it took uh, nine minutes of you rambling on and something about your air conditioner. I, I you know, I said to him, look, I, cause I rewatched the video to see, and it was about five minutes in. 
the previous four minutes and 59 seconds were basically explaining the supply shortage issues because I do not think most people realize that even just brake pads in August of 20, well, now it's September 1, I'm sorry, September 1 of 2022, we are still feeling the effects of the COVID lot, COVID. It's 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock. The COVID lockdowns. So, yeah. Anyway, so let's get on with item number one. Uh, so item number one, and again, this is a reaction video to uh, Cycling Weekly, gloss paint. Now, um, the return of gloss paint because matte finish paints became very, very popular. And I think they still are. Um, you know, if you're a frame manufacturer, you are looking for that. Oh, we are so light compared to this other brand. And this model is now 700 grams or whatever. Paint does weigh quite a bit. Uh, you know, bikes historically with very beautiful paint schemes on them, like a Colnago or something like that. Paint adds 200 or more grams to the weight of the bike. So as a frame manufacturer, sure, uh, go matte finish, go very, very thin coat, and you've got a an opportunity to reduce the weight of that bike a couple of hundred grams, right? Especially white paint. White paint is very heavy because it's got to cover the black carbon. And so you got uh, some primer coats and some others. I, I'm not a paint specialist. I'm just going off of what seems to be common sense on a white painted bike. Uh, but here's the thing. The matte finish frames, they're very hard to keep clean. Uh, here in the in the shop, whenever I get a matte finish bike, I'm like, oh, how am I going to get this thing clean? There's very few things that work really well to it. And then eventually that matte finish does get shiny. Um, the person on, on Cycling Weekly uh, mentioned that. But, you know, it's a big thing for weight weenies. They want that matte finish because that means that their bike frame is lighter. Um, but honestly, it's really boring <laughs> to have another matte black finish bike. And, uh, and a white matte bike is... A dumb idea so just like white spokes on wheels and white hubs on wheels uh, DT Swiss has done that before Bontra it's it just not not a good idea these things just get so dirty very hard to clean let's stay on topic though uh, number two was integrated bars and stems look as a bike fitter these things are a nightmare and most bikes you can't choose what bar and stem uh, integration you're going to get. If it's a size 56, it's going to come with, let's just say, a, a 110 stem and a 42 width bar. Maybe, right? You can't usually choose that. And so as a bike fitter, when I need to do a bike fit for someone, that integrated bar and stem, I, you know, it's difficult to simulate Hey, this is what a shorter stem would look like, would feel like. This is what a, this rotation of the bar would be different. This is a different shape of bar for your hands. This is a different stem angle, length and stem angle. That is an impossible situation to simulate. Now, I do have a fit bike, so I can do some of that, but not every fitter has that. And you most likely at home don't have that. So how are you going to guess what length of stem, what stem angle, and what bar width. So what ends up happening is you just conform yourself to what's been sold on this bike, and that's not good. But let's just say you want to change it, and now everything is integrated through the frame. Let's say you have mechanical uh, uh, shifting and hydraulic brakes, and and everything's running through the, through the handlebar. Now, of course, there is... Um, SRAM access and now the new Shimano stuff that's going to be wireless for the two shifters to the derailleurs, but you still have to run the hoses through and, you know. So let's talk about the attachment of lights and computers and things like that. Um, you know, if the bar is proprietary 
then they're coming up with their proprietary mount for you to mount your computer or, or mount some lights or maybe you want to mount a GoPro. Maybe um, that's something you want to do. I did a, a video on the Vision Metron 5D and my love-hate relationship with that handlebar. So if you want to do things other than just, I don't know, have a pretty bike at Starbucks, you just, you're, you're limited with an integrated bar and stem. Um, aesthetics, is that the thing? Is, is that why these bikes have to have this integrated bar and stem and integration of this cables and housing has to run through there? I don't know. It just a standard bar and stem like this, super simple, right? Now this is backwards because this is off of my tandem. So the stem actually goes forward um, to attach to the seat post of the captain and the stoker. This is the stoker's handlebar. But, you know, for bike fitting, there was another thing that happened or has happened is that I had a lady come through and she was having a really tough time with her hydraulic disc brake. Um, well, I, I've cut to the I've cut to the <laughs> to the punchline, but she had a really hard time with her reach. And so the bike fitter kept putting shorter and shorter stems. And that compromised the handling of the bike significantly, you know, to where she had a 70 stem on her bike. And I was like, why do you have a 70 stem? Oh, I can't reach the bar. So it turns out that her real issue was that the handlebar reach was too long. And then you had the longer type um, disc brake uh, lever body. And so that exacerbated everything, right? This, this bar was longer. So let's just simulate that this curve is actually going to be here. So we... We found a bar that was two centimeters long, uh, shorter, a shorter reach, and then we put on a 90 stem. So we took the two centimeters that the bar was too long, put that as a shorter reach bar, but then we were able to put the longer stem so the bike handled better. Eventually, we would like to put a 100 stem on that bike because that bike will handle significantly better, especially downhill. So these bike fitting issues are paramount uh, as a bike fitter when I see these integrated bars and stems. Did you know that they're heavier in most cases than a really nice handlebar and a really nice stem? It, it just uh, it just frustrates me <laughs> to no end. Um, I think that's it for that on the bars and stem. I had to make notes because I, I wanted to make sure I didn't miss too much. Integration, we talked about this just a few minutes ago. You know, with the integrated um, shifters now, it, it it's a little less of an issue, but you're still running hydraulic lines through the bar, through the stem. Then it runs into the head tube and it runs through the headset bearings or at least one of them. It just... That's terrible design. And if you need to just do a headset uh, replacement or a lube or something like that, if there's just not enough hose, you can't do the lube. And if you need to replace the headset bearings, you need to cut disassembled hydraulic stuff, maybe run a new line. It, it's just, it is way too complicated. And the home mechanic can't even work on it. So, um... Headset bearings is only like a $20 or $30 lube and readjustment and stuff like that. You're going to spend a few hundred if you need to replace them just to get them out and put them back in. Okay. Um, is it about aerodynamics to integrate all this stuff or is it just for aesthetics? I mean, how much of a challenge is that little 
five millimeter break hose going to cause to the wind when you've got this big melon and these wide shoulders on the bike. This is the biggest significant aerodynamic drag component that you need to take care of. That little thin brake hose doesn't do anything, honestly. Think about it, okay? Um, all right, next thing. I would love to see the return of the 27 2 seat post, just like this guy. This is a beautiful seat post from Richie Logic, or from Richie, and this is a Flex Logic, a super, let me see, super logic, flex, blah, blah, blah. Look, let's be honest about this. There's very little you can do to frame geometry to make it more comfortable, okay? Most of your comfort's gonna come from your seat post. I'm sorry to shatter your dreams, but most of your comfort comes from your seat post. It does not come from the rear triangle. Think about it. Triangles are very, very structurally stiff. That's why they're used in bridges and everything else, okay? So, when a bike manufacturer puts an aero seat post in there, puts a proprietary shaped seat post, so it's not even round, it's not aero, it's just, why? Why do that? That is just dumb. Either stay with that round or go full arrow. But other than that, I don't see any purpose for making a proprietary seat post shape. That's just dumb. So let's get back to the, the seat post having the most um, most impact. Notice what I, say, what I did there. Most impact in your ride quality. If you were to design your frame with more of a sloping top tube, then this seat post gets more ability for it to deflect. If you're riding 30.9, 31.8 seat posts, it's not as small of a diameter as a 27.2 seat post and you are compromising a ride quality you should be expecting from you know you're you're spending 10 12 15 thousand dollars on this bike you want ride quality go back to a 27 2 seat post and allow the thing to flex i think uh canyon had a couple of them and um i, I guess the specialized roubaix had some elastomers in there yeah that's the right idea the comfort comes from the seat post not from the rear triangle is very little is very little deflection and drop C stays that's also pretty much of a myth for ride comfort. So yeah, I'm a retro grouch, a 272 seat post and then just a regular round regular round seat post clamp. Super simple, you're not um held hostage by the bike manufacturer for these hidden seat posts clamp mounts you know that come in on an angle from the front you can damage the frame you can damage the seat post the seat post slipping is a problem i had this on my botechia um that has one of these well it has a proprietary shaped post and it has a clamp going through the frame so what i had to do when one of them um broke i <laughs> i found the, the tiniest of washers to put in there to provide a little bit more support. And um, and then I had to go past the 12 Newton meter torque. Not a good design. And then you got the Basso along the back here, Canyon along the back with these tiny little screws, which I'll get to in a minute as well. But yeah, 27. To, and by the way, these are lighter than most proprietary seat posts that you're ever going to find out there. But what if you want more setback or less setback, right? So 10, 20, 25. FSA had a 35 degree setback for a long time. These are zero. So maybe you want a zero offset or all the way up to 35. Or maybe 
you want to flip that around and do the occasional triathlon, the occasional time trial, and then flip it back and go back to riding your regular road bike. It's a, it's something you could do for a few events. It's not something that's recommended, but you could flip that seat post around, flip the saddle around, and here you go. You've increased the seat tube angle. It's not the same. The bike doesn't ride as great, but you can get it done and you bring your seat tube angle for, um, closer to the bottom bracket. And now you can um, just mash on the pedals and you don't have to worry about your your um, your hamstrings or any of that stuff being used. It's just mash, 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 hamstrings and your glutes fine. And then go do your run if you're a triathlete or if you're a time trial, just blow your quads out because it's a 40K time trial and you'll be done in an hour, right? Okay, so that's setback. Um, and we already talked about that it's lighter. And uh, in that Cycling Weekly post, they talked about how um, on a climbing bike, uh, stay with 27.2, but on an aero bike, stay with aero. I don't know. I You just can't, you can't mount lights. I'm sorry, I don't have a, an aero seat post to show you, but you can't mount lights. You can't do any of that stuff. So it, there's just no real benefit for for the the cycling public that really buys these bikes, right? You've got pros racing them, but they're racing in broad daylight and they don't need any of this other stuff on their bike. But the person who can actually afford this bike, they need an ability to put a saddlebag on there, to put lights on the back of their bike. Um, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so let's move on to, oh, and then saddlebags. Sometimes the way the aero seat post is set up this way, it's really hard to mount a saddlebag because it's binding against the back of that aero seat post. Um, all right. Number five, integrated bottom bracket. I'm sorry. Um, threaded bottom brackets instead of all this press fit stuff. This is a Shimano bottom bracket and it's a super simple design where you just thread the cups in okay you just thread them into the frame and that's it okay and these things last literally forever literally forever i've had these bottom brackets in my bikes decades it seems right so this yeah and guess who went back to this? Cannondale. Cause, and Cannondale invented the BB30 concept. But they went back to a threaded bottom bracket on their new Synapse. They also went back to 27.2 seat posts. So there you go. Here's some of the issues that happens. If you have a carbon frame, these things, they ovalize out. They used to be round. They'll ovalize out. And now your bottom bracket is moving around inside there. So that's a problem. Then what you end up having to use is a bottom bracket like this. This is an enduro type bottom bracket where this threads into each other and it fits inside of a press fit type frame. But then it doesn't matter if your, if your um, bottom bracket opening, your ID has ovalized or if it's irregular or anything like that. If it's out of spec, you throw in one of these threaded bottom brackets, you're done. It's fixed. It's better. The bearings in here, angular contact bearings, much, much better design. The Shimano BB86 bottom bracket is amazing. It lasts a very long time. No creaking, no noise, nothing. Why? <laughs> well, because Shimano has a bike building book that is given to manufacturers and here are the specs, here are the tolerances. If you're going to build a bike with a BB86 bottom bracket, you must follow this spec and our Shimano bottom bracket will work beautifully in it. And guess what? It does. I have a Bianchi XR4. I ride that thing a lot and very hard, by the way. And that bottom bracket, Shimano BB86, press fit, is beautiful, super smooth, quiet, 
no noise whatsoever. Um, you know, the Synapse we talked about, and then the, S the Tarmac SL7 also went back to a threaded bottom bracket. Now, some folks say, well, if you go threaded bottom bracket, then you're stuck with this width of a, of a frame and, you know, the BB-86 and 386 EVO, all that stuff made a wider bottom bracket area and then more purchase for the chain stays. You know what? It can be done. Figure out a way. If you're a carbon manufacturer, you'll figure it out. But it just works better to go back to a threaded bottom bracket. I think that's that for the bottom bracket. Lastly, well, there's two more. Hang tight with me. One of the most annoying things for me as a mechanic is when I'm working on a bike and you have these super small um, thread uh, bolt heads. So for example, derailleur hangers with two millimeter uh, bolts on it. That's just stupid. Not to mention that there's 5,000 different derailleur hangers, but why have those tiny, tiny, tiny little bolt heads? It just doesn't make any sense, right? So two millimeter, two and a half millimeter. You got three millimeter um, bolts on bottle cages. So one of the things as a mechanic, there's certain things you expect on a bike. You grab a four millimeter to go take off a bottle cage. Oh, it's three millimeter. Or you're working on a derailleur and you're expecting a four millimeter bolt head for the anchor to for the cable anchor and it's torx or you know you're working on this seat post and most seat posts are just allen head and this one is torx it just <laughs> so why why do something different just for the sake of being different i you work on a derailleur and the limit screws are allen head and then the, the the cable anchor is torx and then you know the the b adjustment is now a screw so you need a screw a phillips screwdriver why <laughs> why do you need three tools for one derailleur it just that just drives me nuts it's just stupid um so that's just something that I don't know why it evolved this way, but it has. Um, what else do I have here? Um, yeah, okay. So let's move on to the bonus because they only did six on that video. So now let's talk about the bonus round. The Cycling Tips website, uh, web channel, sorry, YouTube channel did a review on the Cannondale Synapse and how beautiful it rides and all this other stuff. Yeah, sure. It's got 32 millimeter stock tires on it. Of course, it's going to be smooth. I mean, <laughs> just the marketing hype. You got to see through it, people. You have to be able to see through the marketing hype. I hope you're still watching this video. If you are, please put a smiley face in the comments. Now, they talked about at the uh they were doing a test ride on it one rider a um had already ridden the bike gave it to rider b rider b went out on a ride and the lights didn't come on even though this whole part of this new synapse is as soon as it starts rolling all your stuff's gonna work well it didn't work because rider a still had that bike controlled by his app Okay, why do you need an app to ride a bike? You see where this retro grouch comes from? Why do you need an app to ride a bike? Why do you need an app to control your lights and your uh, radar? Now, from Cannondale's perspective, they said, well, look, we uh, asked a lot of our consumers and they said, yes, I have a headlight, I have a taillight, I have a radar system, I have this, I have that. And every day after my ride, I got to take them all off and find all individual charge cables and do this and do that. I completely understand that. I do it. But now you need an app to control your headlights, your taillights, and your, um, and your radar. Not to mention you don't get to choose which lights you want to run. So they're not very bright. 
maybe, you know, one of the things I love is exposure lights. With exposure lights, I can program how long I want a light to last. So if I am looking at a certain ride and I want to choose how long I want my headlight or tail light to last. And oh, by the way, it's printed, well, right underneath the clamp, but that's okay because you can just move that out of the way, right? So even if I don't have the manual with me, it's printed right on the light. So I can program this light to last as long as I want it to, right? I can do the same with the tail light, which is why I like exposure lights. So you don't get to choose your lights and you have to use an app to run your bike, I, just just stupid. Anyway, that's all for today. <laughs> oh, actually, I was holding this bolt and it was part of the item number six. So look at this nonsense here. If you could see that, and if you can't, what this is, is a bolt that holds the I'm trying to see if I can get that to focus this is a bolt that holds the uh, clamp for the shifter to the handlebar and this is SRAM so I need to pick on SRAM again so one of the things that bugs me about SRAM is they're always innovating for whatever reason and they always want to be the lightest group and which by the way weight is not that important so they have a hollow bolt i mean seriously would you save a couple of grams so that you can then post that your shifter body uh is lighter i mean you're just looking for something to fail when you use stuff like this don't use hollow bolts. Use a, use a good steel bolt. Don't worry about titanium hardware. Okay, sure, maybe, but come on. Stop chasing silliness of weight and do things like this, okay? All right, so that is all for today. Please like and subscribe. And please make some comments down below because I'm sure you have your own opinions. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time and your attention. Thanks for watching.